Warm hellos. Welcome to the first call taking place on September 3rd. This meeting mirrors a little bit of the format that we had in the last call taking place on August 20th. We'll be checking in on the data cap refresh. So those of you on the call will be going through the list of allocators impacted that should be receiving an update shortly. Check in on issue 137 on what we're looking at as far as timelines, really prioritizing the refresh and answer any questions you have on that. Then we'll move into allocator applications. Over the last 30 to 45 days, we've received almost 20 applications for allocators. We'll talk a little bit about what those applications look like, expectations on timeline, and some clarifications you may see posted to each GitHub issue. As far as FAQ and tooling, we'll talk about selling data cap and just check in on how that process and economy works and accordance with the governance rules. And finally, as far as tooling, multi-sig changes and how that impacts data cap out issued as well as GitHub repositories. If always, if you have questions, feel free to post them in chat or just raise a hand as we go through it. This call is taking place on 3rd of September. Next call is 17th of September, and the link is in the slides. These slides are posted in the Phil Plus channel as well as each GitHub issue after they're released. Check in on the metrics since we last talked. So on August 20th, we had around 86, excuse me, 179 clients served. Right now we saw that jump to 191. So that's 12 new clients, which resulted in 26 petabytes of data cap going out. And that was issued by 50 of the allocators in this most recent cycle. All right, data cap refresh. So I see some of you on the call right now. You see your name on this list. Essentially, your diligence has been completed on the governance side, on the tooling side, on the watchdog side. And what you'll see posted shortly is a comment from Galen in your actual refresh application. What Galen will outline is any of the issues that might have been identified. What we found was a divergence from behavior that took place in the first round to the second and third. So what we're really looking for is to kind of coach and help and see what we can do to fill in the blanks on some of those issues that came up. But if you were an allocator that's awaiting refresh and your name is on this list, you'll see that posted in your GitHub issue from Galen shortly. Is a recap on what the timeline looks like for that refresh application. As you submit, the fill watchdog will then pull a lot of the metrics that went back. So this could be the CID report, this could be the Spark Retrieval report, this could be looking at like the breakdown that we have for the review that takes place. That goes to governance who compiles that and looks at each one of the applications that were submitted from clients, what they actually submitted in their like request, and then what was actually done. And then it's up to the allocator to do the same thing. And so that's kind of the coaching that Galen is putting in those issues. The intent is not to just stonewall, but it's really to make sure that these allocators are building in the best way possible. So again, that's what results in this timeline as it goes forward. Some of the things that Galen will be leaving comments on and we're really looking for clarifications to make these a little bit better, is anything that's missing. So if you submit on behalf of your organization and your GitHub handle doesn't match the application, it really breaks it down. And what the Phil Watchdog will do is also go back through those metrics. The second and third things is that it's just not fully complete. We've seen these with some clients where they'll submit a form to the allocators but there's really not a lot of information. It's just like an empty piece of paper as far as who they are, what they're doing with the data. So Galen's really reading through those and leaving diligence comments on like, this isn't answered from the client application. Why was data cap given? So that kind of makes it a longer process as it goes through. Oh, Galen's on the call and I see you have a hand up. Galen, floor is yours. Sorry, yes, thank you. I was trying to get unmuted. Um, Thanks for uh, thanks for kicking us Alan, off. And if you can hear it. us, floor is yours. Can you hear me? Uh oh. Yes, we well, can hear you. Oh, you can. Okay. Um, as Kara was saying, a thing that we're seeing in a number of these um, reviews this go around, we're seeing increased compliance with uh, Spark Retrieval, which is great. We're seeing a number of teams that are talking about some new retrieval tools and how they're looking to uh, integrate those. Also great, we'd love to see it. We're seeing some allocators that are completing their own diligence reviews and posting those things publicly, collating it into that GitHub issue. That's fantastic. Um, a couple things that we will remind you of, a you know screenshot of something 
taken out of context where someone else can't necessarily see all of the evidence, um, that is not going to be sufficient. If you're going to post a screenshot, you need to at least link back to whatever that um, additional documentation is. So for example, if you're going to post a screenshot of you know, a GitHub uh, comment back and forth, go ahead and also post the link to that GitHub comment so we can go see it in the context of that thread. Um, this, again, you know, in a world where all of these things um, can be manipulated or fabricated or taken out of context to mean something else, uh, our, our role here is to go do the diligence on the evidence that is being presented. So supply us with that evidence. Similarly, though, if you post you know, if you just post a screenshot of an, you know, snippet of an email without people being able to see all of the details of that email, that's not necessarily going to be sufficient evidence. Now, that doesn't mean that all of the community needs to be CC'd on every email. That's not reasonable. That's not the expectation. Um, but it is just to say that there may be times where if you are using something like that as sufficient evidence for checking business ownership. Um, we, the governance team, may need some additional way to get some insight into that um, above and beyond just a screenshot. Also, a thing that we're seeing is a number of um, client applications that are incomplete. If a client submits an application to an allocator using various front-end tooling and they don't respond to questions, the allocator Maybe you want to give them their first tranche of data cap, but until they have provided sufficient information to fill out that whole application, you should not continue working with them or approving them. They can go back in and, and edit and update um, that application or put that information in GitHub. Um, so that's a, that's a couple different things. As we've said, we look back through each allocator's application and we review their initial application what kind of clients did they purport to be working with? We try and connect that with the clients that they are working with. So again, if you are working on you know, your own diligence review, go look back at your initial application. There were 60 questions in there about how you were gonna run this pathway and what tools you were gonna use. Um, that is the evidence that we kind of hold you to. So they continue to take a lot of time. We continue to invest in tooling to make these better. Um, there are some, you know, there's some things, uh, on the horizon that we're getting towards. Um, we also continue want to see more work around different smart contracts and different onboarding pathways. If you are an allocator and you're building, you know, a new pathway and you're waiting for your new application to get approved, go check the request for allocators, go build a small, narrowly scoped onboarding pathway. Um, from that request for allocators and start there. There's a number of projects that we want to see different kinds of smart contracts or staking opportunities. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I think that was all I had on the uh, data cap refresh. I put the, the rest in the chat here. We've got, like you said, those 14, we're almost done with those and we should be seeing um, comments from me back on all of those um, with a couple of you know, clarifying questions as well as the current amount that we'll be requesting for refresh. And we'll start getting that refresh from the root key holders. Thanks, K Ray. Hey, thanks, Galen. Will Marta, I know we have you guys on the call. No pressure, but if you wanted to add anything about the tooling that's coming, feel free to jump in at any time. So as Galen mentioned right now, what we're looking at are some of the key metrics that are being pulled both by watchdog and then by the manual review that takes place and so they're listed here we've talked about these before and the big thing is just making sure that this makes sense and there's quality data coming on board so as we tighten this process up and make the application a little bit more seamline for you that should hopefully improve this diligence review process We'll be responding to 137 after this closes, and what we'll be doing is adding some more comments about the use of tags, timelines, and then using that template form. And then the goal is that from the time a allocator reaches that 75% and begins to fill out the application, it's less than two weeks from that time frame, which should be in line with the data cap dispersal that we've been seeing from some of our most active organizations. So the proposal will cover a template for allocators to submit 
right now, each allocator just fills it out with the information that they're pulling, but it's not really directed for like, what is the fastest way to get that and then get that reviewed. So what that template will do is pull that information out of each organization and ideally put it in a format that's quick for you to fill out, it's standardized and that you know what to expect. Then we're looking at 72 hours and that should be the ideal back and forth between an organization that's answering questions. Some of the questions might be, hey, we're missing a link or where was the diligence done on that? So if we're looking at that three day turnaround, that really keeps it narrow in scope. If you look at some of these refresh conversations, they become quite lengthy. And so the back and forth on that, that should hopefully make it a lot faster. And then with the issue and clarifying questions, everything going out, start to finish. Again, the goal is two weeks. Please let us know if you have thoughts or feedback. The best way would be on this call for any kind of discussion or in issue 137, which is linked in these slides. I'll pause and see if anybody has any input, thoughts, or suggestions on this topic. Yeah, hey, um, so so in regarding to this proposal, right, so which means the allocator will be giving like 72 hours to respond, so like three days, and then it will be like two weeks for the uh, watch that or either the community review uh, with of the issue with the clarifying questions. Um, so uh, this is Wayne, so I'm, I'm part of the greater heat. And what happened here is that three weeks ago, we already respond to the questions from the fell wedge logs. So right now it's really like three weeks. So it's, it's like a more than two weeks right now. So I'm not sure how, how, how will, will that actually really going to be two weeks in the future? Yeah, Wayne, that's a great question. And this is one of the things we're working on. I just went back to the slide, which shows like the chart of how this flows out. In the old LDN model, if you remember from how the notaries was based, it would all pull from the same amount of data cap, which had a lot of pros and cons. One of the cons was that it was very hard to run individual diligence on notaries. But one of the pro was that that data cap was continually topped off. The situation that you're describing is one of the ones that we're working to like fasten that. And that's that root key holder section. So once the back and forth has been done, we've kind of verified all of the diligence has taken place. Your thumbs up, good to go. Then the last step is having a neutral third party look at everything and authorize that. Right now, that's still manual because of the way that this allocator program was set up while we, we develop these toolings and processes. So what we're working on is improving that particular mode, which is that root key holder posting after all of the comms are done. And that's, yeah, that's an area for improvement if we want to get that speed much faster for you. So that's what's happening in this case. And thanks for that. Is there anything else I could add? Yeah, got it. Thanks for that. Well, for the current applications, uh, the refill, uh, like earlier in the call, you mentioned that you guys are working on it to get it done. So hopefully we, we can see the result in another, like at least one week, I guess. Yeah, that's what should be happening. You'll see the post come through from Galen that spells out the last and remaining steps for anything to be issued. And then going forward, what we'll be looking at is like making these timelines work for everybody. For a clarifying point with the 72 hours that we have listed here, that's the goal that we're looking for. And it's not just the allocators, but it's the governance team as well. Sometimes while we're waiting for an update, it might be a week or it might be two weeks. And I think what we're trying to do from the governance standpoint is prioritize updates based off like what we're hearing from you, the allocators. And so for those of you that have allocated your data cap, I think it's around 12% of the available allocator pool right now. This is an issue, so we're prioritizing it. So that 72 hours, that's a lot for the governance team as well, so that if you have a follow-up question, you're not having to wait for a week while we batch respond to these. So that's where you'll see that come through. All right, thanks for that. Yeah, cheers, Wayne. And here for anything else anybody else wants to dive into. So we kind of summarize these key points, but just to foot stomp on it, we're hoping and looking for testing as we go through this new way of doing it, that there'll be a standardized form that should make it a lot easier for both the governance team, the watchdog review, and you as the allocator to pull what we need for this and make it a lot faster. Having like an agreed upon timeline where we're communicating with everybody involved and then working on how we can fasten up that final step to get the data cap out and onto your ledgers.
All right. There have been around 20 applications submitted for new organizations to join the program. We've kind of talked in the past about how many manual pathways we have running in the allocator fill plus pathway right now. I think it's around 50, which accounts for roughly around 70% of all allocators that are currently operating are on that manual pathway. So a few months ago, we published this organization-wide request for please, if you are wanting to join the program, clients who are looking to store their data have a plethora of options right now with various allocators. So as far as adding new ones that are doing the same thing, it's not a cost benefit when time can be dedicated to say refilling and making that process much faster versus kind of going through these. So if you've submitted an application, and this might apply to two of you that are on the call right now, you might've seen like a comment that was left in that application. I like to talk about that as well as like what we're looking for. So starting with what we're looking for, Galen mentioned, if you're keen to become an allocator and you're just a manual pathway, there's really not a lot of, not a, not, not a lot of novel approach to how we can like benefit the network by having that added. But there's lots of value for automated tooling that can benefit others and brings by. So in your application for that, if you've listed RFA, essentially my reason for becoming an allocator is either manual or RFA, you'll see a comment from me posted. And what it's just saying is essentially we have all of these allocators doing this right now. What is different about your methodology, which brings something new, which warrants this? So if you have any changes, I've heard great ideas about KYC proposals, automation with GitHub auth tokens, really doing some things that not just benefit yourself, but we can pull that forward. That's where we're really investing the time. So I wanted to pause because there might be someone on the call that has questions about their application or anything on the process. This is your time, open forum. Uh, I think previously on two weeks, I think a few others calls before we we talk about like how how to determine uh the data cap refresh that will be given to the allocator. Um, so because from the greater heat, this is our second time, the second refill right now, and we are requesting for like twenty pips, right? So um, I'm I'm not sure like for this time like. How 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 would that going to be de determine whether we're actually going to like get the the amount that we requested, or whether there will be like maybe it will be reduced or maybe it could get more. Yeah, Galen, do you want to take that? Sure, happy to take that. Um, hi Wayne. <clears throat> Sorry, the tickle yes. in my throat this morning. We um, we have had another team already um hit that same level of um refresh and compliance and they've gotten their 20 pibs it is a similar process so we're, we're trying to apply the same process to all of these compliance reviews so we look at all of the available information um so how what was the behavior leading up to the first review what comments kind of were left what interventions happened so for example if we got to the first review and we said you know, we're not seeing a lot of retrieval yet, but we know that retrieval is new. What are you doing about that? If we made that comment and the allocator came back and said, we understand, here's what we're doing. We gave that 10 from the time that we gave that 10 to now, how has that behavior changed? Did that behavior continue to become more in line with the program? For example, did uh, retrieval continue to increase, were there continued diligence questions, were there, you know, new clients onboarded with more, um, you know, questions being asked, or did that behavior maybe shift into uh, less compliant? Were larger allocations given to clients that were not showing any signs of improving? Were new clients onboarded? that did not have complete bookkeeping or new allocations given out that didn't match the tranche schedule. So basically from for each kind of round of these compliance reviews, uh, we wanna look holistically at the behavior in that time frame, but also as it compares to the previous review cycles. And if we continue to see that trend line increasing, so if compliance is getting better, if client behavior is getting better, then we want to continue 
doubling those allocations to give more runway to these teams that are showing activity and compliance. And if the opposite is true, if we're not seeing improvements, maybe we give another 10 PIBs instead of doubling it to 20. Um, and we say, we're not seeing improvement on these metrics uh, that you said we're going to get better, or we saw this behavior that is suspicious or not in compliance. What are you doing to address it? Because again, we know that if an allocator gives data cap to a client and says, hey, you need to go do deals with the people you said you were, and then that client turns around and does something different, if the allocator intervenes, that's good behavior. But there's a lag time in all of these, right? So we we want to look at this whole kind of funnel of allocator to client, client to SP, and where the allocator is intervening at each step. So it is possible that from looking at this diligence review, that greater heat has continued to improve. And if that's the case, then we'll be asking for a doubling of that allocation um, from the root key holders. But all yep. of those comments are going to be coming out, like we were saying, this week. Got it. Thanks for that. That's mm -hmm. very clear. So, um, there was another uh, question in the chat about... Um, um, from EF um, issue number 80. That one's in this current batch. We're reviewing that one. Um, and there, um, and Eric, same thing, um, had a question about theirs. They're all in this, in this current round. And so like we've said, the community proposed that service level agreement, um, kind of that SLA timeline. We want to see what we can do to hit that. Um, and kind of where can we make up time uh, this also goes to a thing we talked about two weeks ago as well as something that came up in the public slack um, the team has to set priorities um, i think that most of the people on this call if we did a quick poll of the, these participants they would probably agree that the highest priority is completing these compliance reviews as quickly efficiently and accurately as possible. Now, I know that you know the 24 participants on this call is not the entire community, um, but these are the active allocators that are currently onboarding clients. And that is where we are investing our time in trying to do these compliance reviews quickly, accurately, what can we learn from this manual process so that we can get better tools. But as a result, there are other work streams that we just are not able to prioritize as heavily as these compliance reviews. And those are, like Harry mentioned, new applicants. Uh, but another thing that came up in the public Slack was around um, inactive allocators. Um, and just a question of, you know, what are we doing about inactive allocators? I, uh, I'm, I'm in the position that I think that that is a lower priority for us to kind of go try and chase down inactive allocators that have maybe five PIBs. Um, sorry, Kerry, we're just going open discussion here. I'm sorry. Um, but I, I think that, you know, it, with the limited resources we have, like going, investing in these compliance reviews and get in that service level agreement of 72 hours with a two week total turnaround. I think that that is going to show more traction in the community than going after allocators who haven't had clients apply to them. Um, additionally, on that point, we are, and maybe this is a thing I might be scooping you yet again um, on tooling, we are making more improvements to um, client-centric landing pages. And so we, we had some previous tooling where clients could land and apply um, under the kind of direct client application or the large data set notary process. Now that we've you know blown this up to have a lot of different allocators, we're working on building a landing page that we could direct all clients in the ecosystem to, and they could help find the current active allocators, understand the differences between them, and get linked to one of those allocators to apply. And it could be that we have allocator pathways in the community that 
have five pibs. They applied to work with clients and they just, you know, it has been a lower priority for them as well. And they have not gone out and done business development or client discovery. Um, and as a result, they just haven't seen traction of new clients applying to them. So it's possible that when we stand up this new landing page and we direct more um, ecosystem, uh, you know, data onboarding clients to them, we may see an Im improvement. Um, and if we did a lot of work to go try and weed out inactive allocators now, I think we would be doing ourselves a disservice. Um, so that's my two cents. I don't know if anyone, you know, on the call had a similar or different opinion on that prioritization uh, around inactive allocators would be happy to hear other takes. Hello, sorry to jump in. Uh, uh, this is Joe because uh, I'm going to catch the airplane. So I just want to update uh, about our pro project. Just give me two minutes. It's okay. Sorry, which project? Yeah, uh, uh, Topu. Topu. I'm Joe from Topu. Topu. Yeah, Topu. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to have a chance to share the Topu distribution status. So in the second round of the 10P, we cooperated with four clans, uh, each of them bring us uh, more than six SPs. So there are four clients uh, brought us uh, 30, uh, 32 SPs. So our SP are uh, distributed in US, uh, like uh, LA and the Korea, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Thailand, Japan, and also other regions. Uh, almost three months has been passed since we gained our second round of 10P. But during a time, we approached a number of SPs and would have had the opportunity to finalize the 10P allocation more quickly. Uh, however, we paid a lot of attention to whether these SPs support Spark, but we made many SPs using the uh, Venus system and also DDO model, but we decided to turn them down because uh, uh, Venus and the DDO do not currently support the Spark protocol. So our team member, believe that the healthy development of the Filecoin network is very important because of this. So we will continue to rigorously screen our SP that can support Spark. And also we request and also guide our clients to cooperate with SPs that support Spark. Yeah, that's the update. So thank you for your attention and support. Joe, that's great. I'm looking at your application for refresh. I just wanted to call it out. I put it in chat. It's a great example of like giving a lot of the data up front as far as like where the SPs were, what the distribution schedules were, did they meet that application? And then what you'll be hearing back as a member of either the governance or the watchdog, kind of going through that, if there's clarifying questions, they'll post it. Otherwise, that's a great format as far as posting those links and posting that diligence that you've done. So Nice job on that, and thanks for sharing. I linked it here in chat for us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Galen. Galen, if you're still on the call, can I pass it over to you for the first topic here as far as like issuing of selling of data cap and what the difference is in the two? Otherwise, I'll kind of like walk through what the difference in finance is. Yeah, um, we saw uh, this came up recently where there was sort of a a, um, a portal for people to submit uh, basically bill for data cap. Um, and this became a question of what is the what is the difference between just selling fill um, without any other additional sort of diligence information? Um, and I think that there there are going to be some gray areas in this. Fundamentally, though, one of the big things that we wanted to push with this allocation cycle was we wanted to have clarity and support for allocators to have a fee structure. Um, this was a thing that in previous iterations of this program, you know, we really tried to have allocator teams uh, or notaries at that time separate out their, you know, other business interests in the Filecoin ecosystem and just offer these notary services um, kind of fully free of charge. What we you know, heard from a number of community members, uh, what is reasonably true is that if you are building an onboarding pathway 
there are costs associated with that. And it is reasonable if you are providing a service in this ecosystem for you to have some kind of fee structure on that service. Um, we've seen, you know, some people have things like a simple application fee where there's just a flat application fee. Um, then that can help cover just the cost of whatever staffing headcount to review these um client applications. We've seen ones where there are proposals for different market-based structures where a client would basically attach, you know, a fee, a paid amount of money uh, to use this market structure. And then SPEs would also attach bids um, and win bids and have a kind of a downward bidding pressure uh, to get that data. Uh, I would still like to see more of those market structures, but fundamentally, those market structures have kind of fees or fill uh, token connected to them. Um, it would be easy to just look at that entire market segment and say, well, that is just selling data cap. Um, but I don't think that that is an accurate or complete um, answer to what's happening here. So what we want to see is that an allocator is saying, I will perform some kind of diligence to assess whether this client is a right fit for this ecosystem. Are they a real client with real data doing real distributed onboarding? A way that I can tell that this person is aligned with this ecosystem could be that they are willing to stake or attach a fee um, you know, a, a token amount of money to this interaction. Um, we've seen various things, proposals from different community members around, you know, staking an amount of money into a smart contract and then having the terms of that smart contract basically be enforcing the compliance around SP distribution. And once the client successfully onboards and that SP um, distribution matches, that that smart contract could be released. So there's a lot of different ways that we could use fill um, to kind of reinforce this KYC diligence process without necessarily needing to trade, um, you know, subjective information about a client or without having to make claims. Now that again, that is different than just saying I could go to a platform. I could transfer an amount of fill with no other information, and I could get a seemingly unlimited amount of data cap based on however much I was willing to pay. Um, that is not the same thing, because if you're running a business, there are ramifications on you capturing some amount of diligence on these people that are paying you, right? Anyone who is collecting these fees needs to have some kind of accounting and bookkeeping um, in order to say, you know, we have we have revenue coming in from somewhere and we are doing a certain amount of diligence to verify that that revenue stream is legitimate. So the, the issue here, if you were to really boil it down, um, in my mind, the difference is, are you are you still capturing some kind of bookkeeping, auditing, um, KYC diligence information? Is the amount of the, the fee that you are charging compared to the amount of data cap that you are providing? Are those things aligned? Are there guardrails? Um, you know, how do you avoid various civil attacks? How do you avoid um, something like, you know, a, a massive uptick if suddenly your pathway became very popular and you were getting? millions of microtransactions with that. Do you have safeguards in place uh, for things like that to throttle your, your pathway? Um, so those are some of the questions that we would want to see. If none of those kind of guardrails or additional accounting or bookkeeping or diligence exist, and it is simply, you know, trade fill for DC with no other information other beyond an address, um, that becomes a little more suspicious. And that's where we it starts to look a little bit more like outright selling of data cap. So 
that's kind of, you know, how, how we've been thinking about it and what we've been investigating. And I think this is reinforced by the questions that we ask in the application when we ask about fee structure. Um, and like I've said, I would love to see more teams that are saying, here's the service we provide. We will, you know, we will stand up a smart contract. The client will need to stake an amount of money into that smart contract. The terms of that smart contract will be basically compliance with our pathway. Um, once they are in compliance, we could release those funds and they could receive an amount of that funding back. Um, you know, once they've, they've staked it uh, to show long-term alignment, um, we could see more fee structure markets with bidding. Um, we could see more outright service providing where an allocator would say, I will build an entire matchmaking, um, you know, data onboarding tool and I will charge my users a monthly service fee to use this tool in addition to the diligence that I'm doing on these users. I'm you know, verifying that they are a real client through these diligence questions in order to create an account. I have, I have captured you know, client information about them in order to set up a monthly subscription fee to use my tools. I have methods in place to verify that they have real data and the onboarding tool that I have built is doing all of the sharding and deal making on the back end with a chosen set of SPs that's clear and transparent and consistent. So that's how I know it's distributed. And in that model, you have someone building a full end to end data onboarding pathway and charging a fee for it. And they could be connecting the data cap to all of those deals. Their client doesn't need to know what data cap even is, right? They could be kind of putting all of this into a box, but for the community, the people here, that would be more transparent. And they'd say, you know, this is the diligence that I'm performing on the client. This is the diligence I'm performing on the data. This is the diligence I performed on the SPs. Here's where the fee structure comes in. And we don't need to know what all the pricing is, but in that model, it would be reasonable to say, we're building an onboarding tool. We're onboarding real data to the network. Here's how we know that it's real data. Here's how it can be audited. And in my opinion, I think that there would be fees associated with that and it would be available to get data cap. That's just one example. I'm not saying that's what all allocators like should be doing or what all um, you know pathways should look like. Thanks, Galen. If anybody has any questions on that, feel free to post in chat or comment as always. From a technical standpoint, I wanted to check in on an issue that we've gotten from two organizations and I followed up with you via DMs. I just want to make sure that gets here out for everybody. And that's changing the actual multi-sig address. So this may be a result of like a lost ledger or for whatever reason, a person leaves the organization. This is a big technical backend change. And what happens with this change is there's no way to migrate easily past records from bookkeeping, past distributions. So it is infinitely in everyone's best interest to change the signer, but not the multi-sig. So just putting this out there from a tooling perspective, that if this does occur, we'll be kind of following up and really kind of pushing for that and asking any clarifying questions. So again, this would only apply if for whatever reason you no longer had access to that ledger. So with that, we'll open it up if we have anyone on the call with questions about the refresh, with applying to be an allocator, some of the rules for governance, or anything that's on your mind. Time and floor is yours. Hello? Hi, Gallum, Kevin, everyone. I sent my link in the chat, number seven, uh, 71. Our team also attended the official govern governance meeting last week. Thanks to Galen and Kevin for your responses. Last week, Galen mentioned that our allocator, study block allocator, was not given priority because it is similar to existing allocator models. We want to emphasize again that while past manual allocators have primarily focused on general data. The study block allocator is the only one specially targeting the online education sector. 
Study block is dedicated to approving data related to online education, which is highly specialized and distinct from our current allocated attributes. Additionally, we have completed the F2 multi-signature setup and the GitHub bookkeeping repo setup on our end. We kindly request the official team to support us in entering the fast track approval process. We are eager to contribute to the Filecoin ecosystem's prosperity and welcome oversight once the allocator is approved. If there are any further questions, we are open to continue discussion on GitHub. Please let us know what additional steps are needed. Thank you. Doc, welcome. I appreciate you coming to the call and thanks for answering all the questions we had in the GitHub application. Before I kind of jump in, how did you hear about Phil Plus and how are you kind of involved in the ecosystem? Jack, while we wait for mics to kind of catch up, that's great. Thank you. I think when we do process and kind of move forward, one of the things that I'd like to call out is the number of retrievals and specifications you have in the application. This will be one of the big things that we're looking at for any new allocators that are brought on. As Galen mentioned earlier, really making sure that we're doing quality over quantity. So if we have, you know, 40 plus manual allocators and we're onboarding you as a new allocator, specifically going after this type of data set and this type of clients, we'll really be teasing out like, what's your connection? How can you operate more effectively for a client than another allocator would be? So that may be your knowledge of the healthcare applications or what process goes into that. So I'll comment back in your issue. So you're tracking that. And as we go forward, I'll make sure keep you in the loop. But I just want to say thanks for coming to this. Thanks for being responsive. That goes a long way as far as like helping get that taken care of. So Jack, thank you. Eric, I see your hand up. Floor is yours. Eric, did you have anything for us? Eric, if you come back, feel free to let us know and we'll help you in the next call or on Slack. We'll make one last open call. If there's anything top of mind or anything on Slack, the floor is yours. Hello, hello. Eric, just in time. We can hear you now if you could hear us. Oh, sorry. Uh, something's wrong with my mic sitting up. Uh, okay. So I, I would like to ask uh, uh, Will. So any uh, suggestion for the for the DDO mode, but they cannot retrieve it by the Spark. Uh, I think one of my uh, SP they said they are using the DDO mode, but they couldn't find the very good result for the Spark retrieval. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, there's not really a great way to link the data that is uploaded with DDO to get the contents of that data for Spark to attempt to retrieve. So 
we need to work with the Filecoin protocol level to have a way to actually understand what is the contents of this data. And so until that happens at the protocol level, we may not have enough information uh, from just DDO as it exists today to be able to do retrievals. And so what that means is for data where the claim is that this is retrievable and public data that is useful to users, it's unclear how that actually is true if the data has been onboarded with DDO and there's no way to link that and actually understand that it is retrievable or not. And in fact, the question is how would that be retrievable uh, if we don't actually have the ability to link and have um, public retrieval of it. Um, okay. So, um, you know, there, there's an additional protocol that needs to get developed. Uh, and I think there are people working on that, but it may be wise to not um, try and do it with DDO if there's no way to actually retrieve it uh, when it's being put on with DDO currently. I think that's as far as I've gotten in the conversations I've had around this is I, I don't know if the data is getting on with DDO, if there's a way to associate that with a public retrievable data. Okay, thanks, Will. So what I would suggest is maybe we can send uh, some uh, public information on the Slack or in the community to suggest the SP do not use DDO right now. Otherwise, it, it will be, you know, uh, broke their result. Their uh, retrieval rates? Retrieval. Yes. I, I and, put an issue on the allocator governance to suggest that as a norm for public data sets. Yeah, but, you know, the results will be taken by all the allocators because the, when the government's team taking review about the result of the allocators uh, distribution, the if the result is bad, but all the bad result was getting back from the allocator. So I think there is a, no fair with on these things. Right. I guess the the. Uh, okay, so so, there's a question. What is the reason not to do DDO deals? And uh, the to say to say that a second time, um, it, it's that um, we don't have any link in a DDO context between the piece that's getting referenced in a DDO and if any content from that piece, any IPFS, any payload, um, then exists that we can begin to spider to attempt retrieval um, because there's no label uh, field, which is the current link to the actual contents in the, the data. And that link is only put in any protocol right now uh, when deals are made referencing the market actor. So they can go through DDO, but you would have a referenced market actor deal associated with them and not be doing it purely through DDO. Um, and, and there needs to be some other protocol either that gets exposed by the storage provider um, or otherwise to, to allow that link into the payload and the contents um, if we're to say that there's an alternative to market and that doesn't seem like it's been really developed or I'm not aware of any option there yet. Um, so that's that's that one. Um, the issue is allocator governance um, issue number one forty seven uh, was the proposal, um, and then uh, so is this fair? I mean, I guess the question is, um, you know, you're working with a client who's saying they're making data retrievable. And they're working with SPs who are saying that. And the question is, what is the the path for that? Well, but how does the network know? And how how do I, as a person or anyone else who's in Filecoin Plus, understand if that data is retrievable? Like, what do I go to retrieve? How do I know that I'm retrieving it? And and so the question is, what what do we mean when we say that this is public retrievable data that is useful to end users? And right now, the best that I know of is that I can get it to it through something like the IPFS gateway. But that means that I need the payload. And so if it's just DDO and it's a data preparation process that hasn't been made fully public and it's not ending up available on IPFS in a way that I can figure out what those IPFS uh, SIDs are and actually get it, it becomes very hard for me to say this is publicly retrievable. Spark is trying to be a proxy of that definition of retrievability. Mm -hmm. That's great. So that, that's, that's 
uh, what I've got right now. Um, I think there there are work on both of these, uh, on both uh, trying to get a, a better protocol here that allows that link for DDO deals, because we do understand that that is cheaper and would like that. Um, but the, the DDO protocol thing that made those deals cheaper um, didn't yet get to the place to, to link the, the sort of data quant quality uh, or, or the data contents, I guess is what I mean here, um, back into um, that, that extension of the protocol yet in a way that, you know, is fine to be a sidecar in, in the same way that the, the retrieval itself is not on chain, neither would this be, um, but it does need to be a norm or a standard somewhere. Yeah. According to the feedback from the SPs, the DDO mode really faster than the, the, the regular deal. Where, uh, that sounds right. Dealing, yeah. So there's the, going to be a lot of uh, desire from SPs to do this. And I think the change in SP stack uh, probably is not hard. And it sounded like Curio, at least, is uh, interested in, in adding this extension. And we can hopefully do that with Venus as well. Uh, you know, but uh, someone needs to propose what that is. Um, I think that's the the next step uh, is that it needs to be exposed somewhere and someone just needs to write a doc of what that is. And then we need the different implementations to implement it. I don't think it's hard. I think it's a pretty simple HTTP endpoint or it's on the info uh, endpoint of the markets. Uh, either of those work, um, but we just need that mapping. Yes, true. Yes, true. So I think we will still need a long time to need the protocol get upgrade. Right or even the uh, it's not upgrade. it's not a chain upgrade uh, so I so hopefully it's not so so long but it will take some dev work and a release of a new version of of either Venus or Curio. Okay, thanks, Will. That's all for my side. Uh, one more question is uh, Gannon. So uh, I'm putting my uh, allocator reviews for the issue one five one. So hope you to take a review for my uh, allocator. Right, thanks. Yes, I'll keep reviewing uh, these allocators. I would love if, like some of these other subject matter experts, like Will, Eric, Wyman, thank you guys. You guys are you you operate on a sort of a different part of this project, um, and I will keep trying to push on these compliance reviews and, and make those faster and more uh, find more ways to make them automated and objective and clear and. Um, I would love for there to be some additional kind of traction and momentum around getting some kind of updates or standards or community awareness. Um, we are not going to single-handedly like come to one unilateral decision or solve, uh, you know, deal making or retrieval mechanisms. I think that the kind of the whole goal is that this is supposed to be a pretty open platform where people can design different types of retrieval, different standards for data onboarding. Um, but I think that one of the things that we're seeing is we we need some more current standards that exist. Um, and, you know, the governance team of myself and, and Kerry, as we exist, we do not have the expertise uh, to kind of author those standards. So I would love to put that call out to the community. Warm hellos. Welcome to the second allocator call taking place on September 3rd. This is the second call recapping these key points on the agenda. We'll check in on refresh, update those of you that are here live on any updates you may have for your application questions. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about what are some of the delays that we've seen as far as timelines for why these requests aren't as automated and talk about some systems we're going to be working on to make this much faster for you and try to get that down to two weeks for those of you that are issuing data cap. We'll also check in on new applications. So if you're looking to apply or come back as an allocator, kind of what that process looks like and what you can expect to see. Check in on two points. These just come out of Slack. One is regards to data cap and how the finances work for transactions related to that as becoming an allocator in the program. And also just a quick check in on Multisig. With as many people as we have on the call, this should be relatively quick. So as always, if there's any questions or any topics that you'd like to dive into, feel free to shoot a hand up and there'll be plenty of time at the end of this call for anything that you may want to invest in as we go forward. All right, so with that, today is uh, 3rd of September. Next call is taking place in two weeks on 17 September. And as far as updates go, we saw 12 new clients, which distributed 26 new petabytes. 
And this is a result of 50 different allocators over the last couple of days. So thank you. Glad to see that on Doherty coming through the network. It goes a long way. All right, so refresh. This might impact, I recognize two names on the call already. There's 15 organizations that have already distributed everything in their first tranche, and they're applying for their second or third. So if your name is on this list right here, what we're doing is we're working through each of these, and I'll kind of explain what that work through looks like on the diligence. But to keep you updated, all of the audits and review and checks have been completed, and you should see a post from Galen come through, if not already, any day now with like next steps or any additional questions that should come through on that. Here's why it takes between three to five weeks, depending on when we receive the application. What we do is we go back and we look at key elements in the actual transactions that were done. And so what we're looking for is like, what's the retrieval like? What was the client application? Was it filled out? Who were the SPs? How was it documented? And some of the reasons for the delays in these applications is if we need to find more information, like, hey, where's the bookkeeping repo? Who were these storage providers? Why can we not find this? It starts this back and forth chain, which can unfortunately lead to delays past what we would have be for the 75%. So you might be waiting on data cap. So really the goal is that no one should have to wait on the data cap. But once you submit it, you're at that 75% threshold. We can get you that data cap within a couple of days. So that's really the goal that we're driving forward on this one. So issue 137 was kicked off. Thank you, ND Labs. And this is just kind of facilitating that conversation for how are we supporting these allocators that are making big distributions, onboarding data, so they're never without that data cap to facilitate. So a lot of the conversation in 137 revolves around getting that timeline below two weeks. So the proposal that we're working on right now, just to keep you updated from our side on governance, is number one, when an allocator organization submits a request for additional data cap, there's no template. So everyone kind of is similar or a little bit different, which means we have to pull back information in different sources. So what's being developed is a very standard template where you'll be able to fill out and link. Here's my first distribution. Here's a link to the SPs. Here's a link to the IDs. And ideally, once this is all in one place, it should really shorten that time frame where it's having to go back and have the watchdog look at it or have a member of the governance team look at it or have a member of the root key holder. So I'm pretty optimistic that that should help a lot. The second thing that we're looking at is like the lightly phrased SLAs for what response times go by. Right now, with so many things taking place in Filecoin and Filecoin Plus, we're trying to prioritize these in a way where once a comment is left, you could realistically expect a comment back from either the watchdog, the community, or a member of governance within around 72 hours. Obviously, no weekends, no holidays, but for the most part, it will be around three days, and hopefully that will eliminate a little bit of the back and forth. And so this means that within two weeks, you should realistically expect, I turn in a request for data cap, I know what information I need to give, and I could realistically count on that data cap being refilled in two weeks. So we're bubbling this up, we're making this a high priority to help those of you that are in this. Right now, it's those 15 allocators, those will get the data cap refreshed. And a lot of this problem will self-alleviate. Once an allocator has been in the system for a while, has demonstrated trust and autonomy, the amounts of data cap that's dispersed go up wildly. So once those five petabytes are allocated, then you'll get into these larger amounts. And hopefully this alleviates this bottleneck that we've kind of found ourselves in as we've kind of streamed to this new model. So thanks for your patience. Thanks for the comms and thanks for the suggestions. They're all heard, they're all incorporated. And as always, please let us know as we make this better for you as we go forward. So ideally what you'll see as we come through here is look for updates from Galen. He'll be updating the tickets shortly. And then you'll see a form coming down for future. And it will say, I'd like to request data cap. And you'll just link out all of the applications in that form. You'll hear back and this will be much faster. So I'd like to pause and see if anyone on the call, Fat Man, Genesis, kind of this affects, if you guys have any questions on this or if you're blocked, whatever I can do to help. Any questions I could dive into for you. Uh, I guess for my side is the uh, new allocator application. Yeah. yeah, nice. When I push that out, I'll link it to 137. Please give me feedback 
what I don't want to do is create a bureaucracy where you guys get stuck in it. So please give me feedback. I'll make this as quick and effective for you as possible. So can do. Okay, thank you. The second point, we talked about this on the morning, but just to kind of keep you guys all in the loop, is we've received 20 applications from organizations either wishing to reapply as an allocator again or come on board to the program as a new allocator. I didn't want anyone to think that they were left hanging, so I wanted to check in on this so that everyone's kind of aware. Right now, we have over 50 manual allocators that are widely available in Slack and applications with their communities to onboard that data. So kind of the way that we're looking at this, very limited bandwidth, lots of things to accomplish. Does it make sense to prioritize bringing on, onboarding, and doing reviews on new applicants that are essentially doing the same thing that many of you on the call are doing? So this means that some applications that have submitted, submitted manual pathways. What I've been doing is starting to leave comments in each one of those applications on reviewing it. And just essentially saying, look, we've got 50 manual allocators that are doing this same thing. What's different about what you're going to do? And what is, the, what is the benefit to the network of bringing these new organizations on? So you might see a comment in your issue if you reapply. The more information, the better. We had an applicant named Jack. He came to the morning call. It was issue number 71. And he was essentially saying that they had connections to healthcare and looking to get involved in this data storage which is great. It's just another way to kind of like self-identify and really look at it. We're also being very strict on like, what does the application look like? So in that example that I just gave, they were gonna require four replicas. So just making sure, okay, if you need four replicas, that's quite a bit. How are you like set up to distribute that? What are your plans for checking it? Just making sure that that's really widely known. So we should expect to see more movement on new allocators coming on board. But again, we're looking for meta pathways that are a little bit different than just the manual. So flagging this, because if you're expecting to come on, what would be really helpful is to let us know in the Slack channel or your issue and just keep the comms going and I'll, I'll return the favor right back at you. All right, these are two quick updates we've seen come through from Slack. The first one, Galen did a really good job on the morning call of kind of highlighting and talking about this. So I'll try to regurgitate his wisdom as best I can. Essentially, what we've noticed is that there was an allocator who was alleged for just blanket selling data cap, where someone could just come and say, yes, I'd like two pips of data cap. Here's my fill, and I'll be on my way. Just want to stress that this was not allowed during the LDN notary system, and it's not allowed during the allocator system. Data cap is meant to go to the clients that have very clear data that are abiding by the rules set forward in the program, not just a blanket distribution. If this gets flagged, it will be reviewed and it will kind of be like, let's let's talk about this and find out what's driving it. And if this violation is taking place, it will result in the removal of data cap from that allocator. Now, that said, it's perfectly fine, on the other hand, to have a business model associated with your allocator, which means that if you are making that deal making, you can have a fee structure set up for paid deals, paid storage, whatever you want to do, but just restressing that just the strict sale of data cap is not allowed within the Phil Plus program. So if you have any questions about that, please let us know. We followed up with that individual to kind of figure out what's going on before we just leap to action. I'll keep you updated. But again, selling of data cap is not allowed in the program. And lastly is changing the multi-sig. So I think this will impact Coin Summer, who's done on the call, and Max. Essentially, if we want to change the multi-sig for an allocator, this is a huge project. It's almost more intensive than bringing somebody new on. Essentially, once we change the multi-sig, any data cap that was issued to that previous multi-sig is then lost, as well as the bookkeeping, the audits, all of the links, they're all forking. And so once we fork that multi-sig, it just becomes a nightmare for transparency, for accounting, for supporting those allocators. So if there's ever a need where you've lost your ledger or this comes through, obviously we can work with it. I just wanted to flag, just so you're aware of it, it's a big deal on the backside and you might see a little bit of a delay in the turnaround given the work that we're doing. It's much, much easier to add additional signers to an already set up multi-sig 
than it is to just bring a new multi-sig onto the network. So I'll be following up with that organization that's changing this, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that we were just not leaving anyone in the lurch. So as far as like new information or check-in, that's it from the governance side. I'd be really keen to hear if there was anything on your mind or anything I can do to help you while we're all together. The floor is yours. Um, hi, Kevin, this is Kev. Um, should I actually connect with you over Telegram or Slack to actually talk about the reapplication? Number one. Number two is uh, with regards to the previous type on selling data cap, when you said that it is okay to have a business structure, uh, does it mean that it should be a uh, pathway by itself? It's a great question. So if I'm hearing you right, there's two talking about a new application and the business structure. Um, what specifically were you curious about with the business structure? And at the very least, I can just make sure that Galen has eyes on this. What was your question as far as the business structure? So uh, it feels to me that uh, the business structure for the part of selling data cap uh, feels like a market-based uh, approach to uh, the allocated pathway. So does that mean that uh, such a business model should be applied as a market-based uh, allocator uh, pathway? Got it. Let me do this. This is a good topic. So I'll put this in writing. That way you have something to come back to. But the difference between a market and then just selling data cap is with your market-based allocator, I would imagine that there would be some type of diligence with somebody submitting to have data cap and have storage versus somebody who just buys it from you. If someone just buys it from you, you don't know who they are, what the data is, and there's no checkup versus a market model where they have to do some type of diligence and bring it on, whether that's a manual review or a market-based review. So the difference is what is the data that's coming and did you verify that that data was for the best interest within the guidelines of Phil Plus? And what I'll do is I'll have Galen and I we'll make a post in the Slack channel and a proposal. That way it's really clear so it's not ambiguous. But data cap shouldn't be sold without a stipulation that's tied to it. I see. Thank you. Yeah. And then what was the application that you were keen to dive into? I'll be happy to pull it up. Uh, so I was uh, referring to a reapplication of uh again uh, all of storage uh, reapplication and uh we also uh, are thinking of applying for a market-based structure as well um yeah so uh it's been a while so i just uh, tasked to actually just check in on the uh application yeah ah, for sure so i saw your guys and i'm pulling it up right now if you see my eyes leaving let me uh, grab it up here Ken, have you already submitted for Origin Story a new application? You're yes, planning? I did. Yes. How long ago? I'm looking in the governance repo and I'm not seeing it. Uh, let me check. Oh, you know, it, it's uh, number 91. Got you here. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, let me do this. I'm going to tag this into this call. I'll leave you a comment. Ken, you guys have been around for a long time. I want to make sure I do right by you guys, too. Yeah, link you. What I'll do is I'll leave this and I'll come back and uh, I'll follow up with you in this issue and just make sure that we just kind of go over this and kind of talk yes. about for some of the issues last time. How can we work together to get you guys what you need for the next time? So we'll start the follow up on communication in this for you. Thank you. Thank and Ken, you. you should still be in the Slack allocator. That's the fastest, most effective way to reach me. I'll pre-apologize with so many Slack channels 
DMs can get lost so easily. So just feel free to tag me in the allocator channel or in that GitHub and get the help. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Right, quick information. So to kind of recap, anybody who submitted their second diligence or third diligence should see movement on that tomorrow or early this week. Anybody who submitted an application, we're not prioritizing those, but please follow up with us if there's some business need or something going on. Or Jin Ken, thank you for that. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Please, no selling of data cap. It's a hard and fast rule. And then if there's a change to the multi-sig, it can definitely slow it down. If you need anything else at all, Slack is a great way to reach me. We'll just get whatever you need as we go forward. I'll pause one last time if there's anything I can get for you guys on the call. All right. Too easy. Well, thank you, everyone, as always. See you there. See you on Slack if there's anything you need at all. All the best, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.